it's a little harder because I'm navigating to a few different things. Okay, so firstly, you will go to portal.hprc.tamu.edu. Um, I don't know if the folks um, on Zoom can see my screen. Okay, cool. So once you go here, go uh, hit the, go to the grace page. That'll take you to this portal page. And then you can go to clusters, grace shell access. And over here, you're gonna enter your password and it's gonna ask for the two-factor authentication. So you're gonna do that um, and it'll take you to the next screen. Um, so you'll have something, okay. Maybe let, let me just do this. So right now we're in the gray scratch. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see this. So presently, if you do PWD, you, you display where you're currently at. And right now I'm in my home directory, right? And to go to your scratch directory, you're gonna say CD dollar scratch. So it's a dollar sign and scratch is all in caps, right? So if you go here and you print working directory, you see that you're now in your scratch space. So now in the scratch space, I'm gonna do git clone and then the URL that you see, right? So uh, if you do git clone and the URL you see, uh, you'll see that it'll start downloading all the source materials to one directory. That's one way of doing it. The alternative way is you can also copy it from your local uh, scratch directory. So we're not pulling anything from the internet, but rather it's, it's on the machine already. So you can do copy uh, hyphen R, that's to copy the entire directory, scratch training, Python geos, um, and you have a directory called notebooks. And you can just say dot at the end for it to copy to the current directory, right? To your scratch directory. So you can do one of these two things. And then what you'll do, I've already done that, so I'm not gonna do them. Um, so then you can go into the Python GS, and then you'll see all these files. So this is on the, this is the only thing you need to do on the command line side. And, um, People are still logging in. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I'm just explaining some basic stuff, so thanks. Um, let me see where we are at. Okay, so if you're familiar with Linux, um, you can follow these instructions like on your terminal or Linux on Mac, right? The only thing is you have to be connected to the Tamil VPN if you're not uh, on campus. Um, and for even for Windows users, you can go to portal, um, the portal thing, uh, you can go to, sorry. Yeah, so you can go to, Portal, click on Grace On Demand Portal, then clusters, Grace Shell Access, right? Okay, so those are some basics. Uh, what about some of the basics? Um, so this is the home page uh, for the short course. And um, so this is where you went to register for this course. So you'll see some pre-class instructions here. Uh, we'll get into that next. Um, then you'll see the slides over here. You'll uh, need to have obtained it. And the skit link is what we cloned, right? So that, that's why I attached this thing. So now let's look at this file over here. Um, it's, it's good to open this file and keep a tab, um, like open a tab and just save it for later because um, there are some instructions that you may need for later, okay? So, um, and, okay, so I think how are you doing on time? So we're six minutes in, so I'm assuming everybody who wanted to join, let's join. 
So let me go back to my presentation. Okay, and my screen is visible on Zoom, just to check. Okay, thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone um, uh, to the short course. Um, thanks for spending your time um, this morning. So I'll just start with some expectations for this course. So the basic idea, um, the way that this course is structured is that you're a geosciences user who's doing some sort of geosciences research. And of course it, uh, it won't be relevant to ev all geosciences because that's impossible to condense it into a single course. Um, but it's for geoscience people uh, specifically working with a lot of data sets, either like in the NetCDF format or like data from the cloud observational data, things like that, right? So the providing this course hopes to provide like a starting point for if you have like existing workflow in like MATLAB or NCL or you use NCO, and if you're not familiar with these tools, that's fine too. Um, you, uh, this course is to give you a feel for like what it'll be like to use Python, um, explore some of the things that are available um, in this up and coming, um, I mean, Python is pretty established at this point, but a lot of the libraries that are specific to geoscience, they're being uh, developed, you know, like uh, there's been like a vast um, amount of development and it's pretty exciting. So we're primarily going to learn about X-Array and many of the other packages that work uh, either built on top of X-Array and so on. And finally, I want to emphasize um, like this course uh, hopes to like, you know, like pique your interest um, in this topic, but obviously, you know, I'll try to cover as much as possible, but yeah. So some quick HPRC resources. Um, there's a Grace Quick Start Guide for people who are not who are new to Grace, just got an account for the purposes of setting in on this class. Um, or even if you're pretty experienced, it's always a useful guy. And there's also like the introduction to HPRC short course, which goes into many topics in good detail. And finally, you wanna, if, if you don't know um, where to ask for help in a general resource outside of this class, um, note down this email because that's where you send all your queries you know, regarding HPRC too. And I quickly want to leave you with some relevant uh, short courses by actually me next Friday and my colleagues um, uh, in the coming weeks. And also, I want to start off with some acknowledgments. So, the great thing about Python, uh, that's I would say somewhat less true about um, other um, other sort of uh, research, you know, scientific software community is that um, a lot of people uh, work on their analysis scripts and make them public. So it's like, it's very open source and democratic, you know, people build on top of um, efforts by, uh, you know, others. And it's not like, um, it's like, it's very open and you can ask a lot of people. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of like cutting edge, uh, which is why you need some tutorials. Um, but yeah, so, like all this material wouldn't exist without like existing notebooks on the internet. So uh, if you get a, if you get a, if you like this course and you want to learn more, that's the way to go. So and also like sincere thanks to um, everybody from HPRC sitting in today and like uh, all the background support uh, for all the technological, you know, marvel of, of like uh, trying to make this course happen. So thanks to the HPRC team and thanks to my IHS colleagues um, and Kristen Think for like the engaging conversation. Okay, so I think we've talked about um, going to 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you um, on the web page. Okay, so we already know how to get to portal, portal hpsd.tamu.edu, click on Grace On Demand Portal, and then uh, take into this page. Now you're gonna click on Interactive Apps and go down all the way and you'll see the Jupyter Lab Geoscience, okay? So basically at this point, you don't need to change anything here. Like uh, you can simply just press launch. Okay, um, so I have a notebook running from a previous session, but this is what it looked like for you initially. You can even give it a refresh if you want. Um, hopefully it's gonna start soon. So yeah, so it changed from that color to blue. Now it's now starting. And so I'm actually gonna go to my previously started notebook, right? So you'll get a button like this when it's ready, okay? Um, maybe let me just use this. So now um, what's happening at this point is um, I'm going to close all of these notebooks because in all likelihood, you're not going to have any of them open. So that's fine, right? So click on um, this folder shaped icon over here. Um, and so I have a lot of directories in my scratch space, but that's likely not the case for you. Uh, instead, you're gonna go over to your Python geos folder that you cloned from GitHub. Or if you copied over the notebooks, the directory will be called notebooks. Um, double click on that and you'll get a directory like this, okay, on the side pane. And let me quickly check if there are any questions. I guess I wanna quickly answer one user question. Um, when you type the, um, yeah. It is, yeah. Added, yep. Okay, so um, for folks who um, did not register for this class, um, let's say by um, 1 p.m. yesterday, 1 or 2 p.m., I think, um, there's another way to go about this. So an alternative thing you can do is, uh, let me go back to my, so you can also go to interactive apps, click on not Jupyter Lab Geoscience because it only works for people um, who um, registered before yesterday um, at noon or you know whereabouts because we had to like add you to the user access list. So if you registered later than that, this thing is not gonna work for you. Instead, you're gonna click on Jupyter Lab over here, okay? Uh, for those of you for whom the previous thing works, leave it as it is, connect. Uh, but for, this is for people who registered late, okay? Um, or uh, if you didn't get a chance to register. So, but you still need a HPSC account to be able to access this. Page. So what you need to do is enter this path in the optional environment. So it's gonna say scratch training, Python geos, Conda, ENES training. So it's there in the instructions text file. Also it's there in my slides. And then you're gonna enter the number of hours as three, number of cores as three, total memory as 30 GB, okay? And then you're gonna hit launch. So again, if the previous Python geosciences, uh, the Jupyter Lab geosciences thing work, don't bother with this. It's just for people for whom it doesn't work. Okay. So, um,
Okay, I think I covered this. Um, so of course, to see that notebook, you must have cloned um, either the GitHub page or copied the notebooks, and then you can go into it and pretty much talked about how, how to navigate to that directory. And if you can't access it, uh, let us know. Okay, so now uh, for the first quick test. Yeah, question? Well, I guess that's trouble with the file. Okay. Yeah, I think Richard can help you with that. Oh, wait. Okay, so over here, you're going to go to zero start here. I can just arrange this menu. Okay, so we just want to check at this point that your notebooks are doing the things that they should be doing. Okay, so uh, on top is just like a textual description of what you need to do and so on. Uh, but I want you to go uh, down here, okay? Um, all the way down to the, the cell. And so, um, and before I begin, uh, for folks who are new to Jupyter Lab, so what is a Jupyter Notebook? Um, it's just, um, so if you've dealt with any uh, programming language like C or Fortran, um, or even like MATLAB, let's say. So for C and Fortran, what you do is you open a text file, um, you type the code in you want, um, and then you compile it, okay? Uh, and the same for Fortran, because these are like compiled like programming languages, right? For MATLAB, if you ever use MATLAB, it's like you type in code, you don't need a full program before you can start running the code. Instead, you type in anything and you can just execute that single thing. So for example, if all you have is a print statement, it's gonna, you can run that print statement. And Python is similar. Uh, you don't need to compile anything in Python. And uh, the same, you know, with MATLAB, they are scripting languages. So what does a Jupyter notebook do that a regular Python can't do? Because in a regular Python, you again write to a text file. So a Jupyter Notebook is just a nice way of uh, having your Python environment on a browser. And it also makes, uh, for example, teaching easier. So that is why, you know, instead of like having all this in a Python code, uh, we have it in a Jupyter Lab interface. And you can also see response real time. Um, as you'll see, you'll see figures and all those things. So that's the advantage. So in a Jupyter notebook, so all these things you see are text, right? They're like static and you don't have to do anything with them, right? But over here, you see this box, right? Um, you can click on that and it will turn blue, um, I think. And then uh, to run it, uh, because this is now code, this is not text like the previous path, this is code. You can just click on this arrow button here, right? Uh, I think shift enter will also work too, All right? So if you run this, um, what you didn't see was for a small you know, fraction of time, uh, the one over here turned to star to show it was executing, right? And then it changed and then you see a hello world. So if you don't, if you have issues with this, let us know. Uh, because that's the first clue that something is wrong. And the second thing is, now go to this second cell. Um, and it took a little time and then it finished without any errors. If, if there's something wrong, this thing wouldn't work. Okay, now let's see quickly what these things are doing, right? So in the first line, it just what we did was we just displayed hello world over here. So it's just a print statement. And if you're familiar with programming, it's what you send to your standard input output, right? Like your standard output. So that's your print state. And what about these import states? So import is a keyword, meaning it's 
it's a it's a word defined by python for a certain use right and so is print for that matter so when you say import x array x array is um what is called a python module right so python doesn't come with x array it has to be uh, it has to be loaded into python somehow this this package called x array so it's an external thing right we could say print because Python by default had the print function. But X-Ray and Tartu Pi, these are two packages that are external to Python. And the reason I wanted you folks to uh, run the cell is to check that your environment is loaded correctly, okay? Okay, so I'm hoping you can now um, see my slides like usual. Um, okay, uh, for folks for whom it's not loading properly, so uh, like I already described an alternative way of opening your Jupyter Lab notebook. But if for some reason you never get the connect to Jupyter Lab button, right? Uh, what to do then? How to ask for help? Uh, it's also relevant to you for like after the session gets over. So you can always click on the session ID. There's this big, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, alphanumeric sort of text there. Just click on, click on that. That'll take you to this, like a window viewer, all in your browser, right? And you click on output.log, just click on it, it'll select. And then you can click on download button. So it'll download it to your, download the log file to your, local machine. And then what we want you to do is email us at HPRC with this log file and you know some more instructions on what, what you tried because that's debugging information that's useful for us, okay? Okay, so um, the next thing is I wanted to uh, continue a little bit. Um, so you, you don't have to do any of this. So I'm, I'm just giving it as an illustration of what I had to do um, to set up the environment that you're using for this class, okay? So we're using what is called an Anaconda virtual environment. So there are many, many ways of using Python and it's because it's not an introduction to Python class, I'm not gonna get into that. But what we're using is something called a Python virtual environment. So it's, it, you can basically think of it as a sandbox. Uh, it's a sandbox in which you have a specific version of the Python interpreter. And you also have uh, bundled with it, many other packages that we need for this course, right? So uh, for example, over here you see Cartopy, Matplotlib, XRA, and all these other things. So I had to install them into the package. Um, so if you downloaded Python from the internet, you're not gonna have them by default, right? You're gonna have to install them. So this is the virtual environment that we're using for this class. So the import statements that we ran before, import X-Array, they work because um, I created this environment. And also like, if you're using it on a new computer, you can follow similar instructions to um, do this. Okay, so I'm a little over time. Um, let me see what time. Okay. I spent 25 minutes with the environment setup, but that's good because we're all uh, set. So now I'm gonna start with what is, um, there'll be a basic aspect to this course and there'll also be an intermediate, okay? Okay, so if, uh, if you have like some prior uh, research experience in geosciences, chances are you used some, uh, you know, like at least like one of these um, software tools, right? And what many of them have in common is they like, they all work with like NetCDF files. Uh, they're all used to like massage data and like whatever format, uh, like whatever way you want, you know. Um, these are uh, nothing to take away from them. Um, like despite showing you Python, like I still like regularly use like NCO, um, quite a bit, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, and so are all, all of the other tools too, right? And they're very optimized and everything. But where they can be, uh, where they can start to show 
the sort of like disadvantage is like with the proliferation of like high resolution data. Like we've, we've had like just an explosion of like data in the geoscience community, like because of like high resolution, like modeling, right? Like that's, you go to higher and higher resolutions to uh, enhance your physics. Um, and also like there's now like satellite data and um, which is like generating high resolution data and like people don't know how to store it, let alone like analyze it, right? Um, so in, in that sort of a sense, they're not always that, um, that helpful. And so what this class will be talking about is the so-called Pangeo stack of geoscience specific software. So at the, at the base of this is Python. So the innermost circle that's Python because of course you're using Python, right? But even with Python, there are many ways to access Python. Like you can access Python from the command line, in which case you'll probably not be using any of these top ones, right? Um, but they're actually using the Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is built on top of Python, right? And IPython is also very similar to Jupyter Notebook. Um, and there is also Cython and so on, uh, which I'll not get into because it's complicated. And then at a more higher level, you have uh, packages like matplotlib. And if you use Python, for scientific stuff, you know, even your know, like class homework, you've used matplotlib to plot, you know, generate plots. Um, and also you've heard of scipy, probably numpy, um, like Python can uh, by default handle arrays, um, but numpy is, you know, takes it to like one level higher. So it's like, it's, it's a much better tool for like working with like arrays. Um, over here, what we're gonna talk about is X-Array. So uh, X-Array, there'll be some of pandas, but you know, just in passing. And then I'm gonna show you what XGCM is, um, Cartopy is, but you know, so I'm, I'm showing you like some of the, you know, some of the ecosystem, right? Because obviously it's not possible to show you everything. Um, the, the interesting thing about this Pangeo stack is that it sort of enables a different way of doing your analysis. So technically what, what is happening right now, uh, it's kind of following this, this sort of a, you know, architecture. So I'm here and we are here with our laptops connecting to Python via Jupyter on a web browser, and meanwhile, um, sorry. Meanwhile, the actual processing is going to happen on Grace, which is a HPC cluster, right? Um, and so, this sort of a thing doesn't exist. Like you can't do similar things with like um, the previous generation of tools. And like MATLAB, like you have to have it on your local machine, um, or like. Yes, you can run MATLAB on a HPC cluster, but still in terms of flex, uh, this sort of flexibility, uh, it's not quite there. Um, so, and not only that, this is not the only way to do business. There are other ways to do things. So basically it's like, you can sort of um, uh, follow like whatever sort of architecture you want. And what do I mean by that? Um, so for example, all these examples, uh, all the Jupyter notebooks, you can run them on your laptop, no problem. You just need to obtain the data. You don't need Grace to do anything, right? You just, uh, it's only that the data sets are sitting on Grace, which is why you need access to Grace. Um, but like what Pangeo enables is, you can either use your local laptop to do the computations, or you can use a HPC machine like Grace over here, Nkar Shayan is pictured, but you can also use the cloud to do your computations. And, and you can use either Jupyter Notebooks through the web interface. You can even run it on a command line, right? Your Python code. And uh, I'm gonna skip these for now. Uh, 
And in terms of like storage formats, um, we're, we're gonna be using NetCDF files at the start. And, but you also have like other ways of like storing data, uh, which allow like uh, faster data access over the internet or data access over the internet. Um, and actually towards the end of this class, uh, we will be technically using the cloud um, for, for some examples. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So this is all pretty interesting. Um, so let's get started. So let me actually go back to the previous slide. So there are all these different, um, for example, if you take ND arrays, so what is an array? Um, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a programming like parlance, an array is like a data structure meant to store like, you know, logically um, sequential, you know, or like consecutive elements, right, of data. Um, an ND array is just an n-dimensional array because um, what we do in geosciences is no longer just like 1D or 2D, it's like three or four dimensional, you know, it's like spatial and temporal. So to process uh, arrays, you have NumPy's, uh, the NumPy package. Um, and of course, this, this class is not an introduction to NumPy class. So I just wanna throw it out there. Um, so what X-Ray is, is it takes um, like, underlying, the underlying uh, format or the underlying concept for X-Array is like, it's, it's still a NumPy array, but you can think of it, um, you can think of it as like a NumPy uh, array with like more metadata. The metadata makes accessing your, um, like doing like different file operations like simpler, and I'll show you. So, and also X-Array also, goes by the nickname pandas for n-dimensional arrays. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into it too much because um, maybe I'll come back to it later. Um, but a lot of X-ray functionality uh, is dependent on pandas. Okay, so what does an X-ray have? So it has, uh, so take a, sort of a, a sample, um, let's say an ocean or an atmosphere data. I, I think this one is an atmosphere. So you have temperature data, you have pressure data, you have elevation, and you also have like land, land cover. And so, um, so the data variables, um, actually it's just temperature and pressure, my bad. So the data variables are just temperature and pressure, but they have, um, they vary along several dimensions, right? So you, you, you can have like three dimensional um, temperature data, um, uh, three-dimensional pressure data. So you have data over here, and then you have coordinates and dimensions to describe the data. And then you have attributes. So basically, um, the fundamental model is still just the data, right? But we're adding all these other helpful labels, you can call them, on the data, so as to make them easier to like understand and like process, right? That's, that's basically what it's happened. So let, let us look at some quick examples. So let's say you have this, um, let's say X over here is a three-dimensional um, uh, and also time varying um, uh, temperature data, temperature for the atmosphere, let's say. So uh, you can simply say, um, the array dot sum over time, right? Instead of like going by the label indices. And I'll show you some examples to begin. Um, and actually I'm gonna skip the slide because the examples are coming, okay? So X-ray is the, is the, forms the core of what we'll be working with. And some other packages that'll come up are Matlab, Matplotlib. So Matplotlib is, uh, a lot more people use Matplotlib than they, do X-ray because it's essential for like making, you know, any sorts of plots using Python, right? So it's, it's a comprehensive library for like many sorts of plotting. Now there's another package called CartoPy, which is part of the Pangeo stack. Um, 
And what Cartopi does is, so Matplotlib by default doesn't understand projections, has no idea what to do with it. So Cartopi um, incorporates that knowledge into Matplotlib. So it's, you can think of it as an external plugin, you know, and uh, it adds that information to Matplotlib. So now you can generate like, plots of you know the globe with like different projections that you want okay so with that said um let's go to our notebooks so we're going to go to the first notebook uh, number one x-ray data structures and hopefully um, people on Zoom can see this also. Um, okay. Okay, so XRA. So what is it? Um, quickly, I wanna say, Data structure might seem a very computer science-y word, uh, but all, all it means is how, how you store the data. Like uh, you, you can, it's like having a system for like um, keeping things together, right? In terms of your data. So that's all a data structure is. So X-ray has like two different models for how it uh, thinks of data, right? And the first one, is an X-ray data array. So like we saw the image previously, we had like temperature and pressure, right? So those are the actual data, like three-dimensional data, temporally, uh, uh, you know, a time varying data. So this data is actually, so this X-ray data array contains all, you know, it, it's, a, it's like a package deal. It, it contains all of these. So, the fundamental, um, so the temperature data, it's actually stored as a NumPy um, ND array, okay? It's basically just an N-dimensional array. So, but it's just a NumPy um, ND array, you don't get a sense for the fact that, first of all, the data is temperature. In a NumPy, you don't have a sense for what the data is. It's not self-describing. So X-ray brings that labeling nature, you know, that meta attribute. And so, and now um, a temperature, let's say the temperature field has four dimensions. How do you know which, uh, which direction is which dimension? Like uh, in a NumPy, you, uh, you just have like dimensions like zero, one, two, three, right? So again, you have like the dimension label to keep track of the dimension. And okay, so let me, so this is, very similar to what we saw previously, right? So now we're gonna start with the first example. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, uh, let us first consider a simple NumPy array of size five by five by four, okay? Three dimensional. So the dimensions are X, Y, and time, okay? In our mind, we know that the X corresponds to values from 10 to 50, Y corresponds to values from 10 to 50, but the time is first four days of 2020. But if I was using an X-ray, uh, ND array to like define this, of course, there's no way to like store this label onto it, right? So, uh, so I'm, okay, I'm, I'm generating some sample NumPy array just to show you what's happening. So import NumPy as NP. So the as NP just means we can use NP in the next line instead of the whole NumPy. It's just a alias sort of a thing. So in this line, what I'm doing is I'm doing NumPy dot random. So I'm just initializing a five by five by four 3D array with random values, right? And the next line is I'm just printing what data, the value of data is. So you don't even have to say print, you can just say data and run this stuff. Okay, so you have an array like this. Uh, filled with random values. Looking at this, is there any way to say which dimension is what? Like, what do you do with this information? It's like confusing, right? Like, 
our intention was that the x dimension, uh, the x coordinate is like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, right? And also like time. But looking at this, there's no way to like, we have the actual temperature data, let's say, but we don't have, okay, what's the temperature at this point? Like, okay, what's the first cell? What's the value of X of the first cell? No way of describing. With X-ray, how we would do it is, so I want you to ignore these two lines for a second. We'll come back to them. So first we do import X-ray as XR, which is just an abbreviation so that we can use X-ray, right? So uh, we say X-ray dot data array. So we're constructing a data array, okay? We're constructing a data array. We're still using this previous NumPy array that we created. It's still the same exact data, right? So that's the first element. But then we say dimensions. We're starting to add labels, right? So you say we have the dimensions X, Y, and time. And then the coordinates just describe what values the dimensions vary over. So the coordinates, just like previous, so X varies from 10 to 50, Y 10 to 50, right? Uh, uh, inputting an array here, right? So you see how like whatever information we had in our mind, we can translate that to a self-describing data array, right? Like it's a data structure that holds all this and you can do very interesting things with that. So for the times, uh, I'll come back to the times. Uh, look, uh, we can also add like attributes, like, uh, like for example, who generated this file, you know, which institution is, is it coming from? and uh, who's responsible, you know, things like that. But also like in the time, we, we don't just need to say time values from zero to 20 or whatever, right? We can actually describe proper a date timestamp. Uh, so we use something called pandas. Uh, so X-ray and pandas are like sister sort of a thing. And so, uh, X-ray inherits a lot of time functionality from pandas. So over here, we're using the pandas date range function to generate an array of timestamps starting from, because I said I want first four days of 2020. So I'm just saying one, one, 2020. So I want four of them, for first four days. So that gives me this time array, okay? And then I'm setting that in the coordinates, okay? And if I run this cell, what results, I mean, the first part is similar to what you saw before, right? But then you have some interesting stuff. So now you have X, uh, X Y, and time, right? Um, let me actually rerun this. Okay. So this is what it looks like. Um, so because you're using a Jupyter notebook, it also, it shows you in a nice structure, right? Um, and of course the X and Y's are integers, time is of time, uh, type date, date time. Thing. So I showed you a NumPy way of doing things. I showed you an X array way of doing things. What is the difference? I mean, yes, like I told you, it's easier to keep track of stuff, but you can also, it also translates to how you write code. So let's say I would like to determine the maximum value of uh, the data was temperature, let's say. Uh, value of temperature for each y value across all times when x is 20. And you have to do operations like this all the time in your research, right? Um, so I'm, I have to select when x is 20, fix the value of x, but take the maximum along the y dimension, right? And also it's time varying. So in x array, we will say, uh, sorry, in NumPy, we'll say data of one because uh, the first position here, uh, not, not the number one, but the first position, uh, this is the second, third position. So in the first position that corresponds to the X dimension because you can mentally keep track of it. So one corresponds to 20. Again, it's a mental track, uh, hard way to do it. And colon just means search for all Y and time, right? And in this array, and over here is a dot function. So a dot operator is basically, you know, so this max is a function. And when you chain this operation using the dot operator, 
this max operates on the previous data. So this is a selection and then the max function operates on that data. And then uh, in the max, I don't wanna just search the max over uh, two dimensions, right? Uh, I just want along the y dimension. So I say axis is one because uh, zero is X, one is Y. And that gives me something like this, right? And I run it, it gives me a NumPy array asset as well. With the same, um, we have the same data, right? Both in the X-ray and NumPy. And in the X-ray way of doing things, it's as simple as this. So this is our X-ray data array DA. Uh, we can use the cell function to uh, select uh, so what we did over here translates to cell. And we can just say X equal to 20 because X array keeps track of the labels. It knows what, which, you know, X value is 20 and that's it. And then dot max compared to the previous line, instead of saying X is equal to one, we can actually use the label of the dimension. So you can say that dim equal to time, you know, the, the name of the, the name of the actual dimension and not just an index. So that's gonna return the same, you know, same value. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a random number. So, you know, the value changes every time. Um, okay. Also with X-ray, because we used Remember we used the pandas date range function to generate the times. Because of that, we can do cool things like, we don't have, you know, we, we don't even have to like confirm to the specific date time syntax. We can even say Jan 02, 2020, you know, with a space. Um, it's almost like magic because if you're able to make something like this happen with your own code, it's a lot of code to like, um, allow for these different possibilities of like, you know, uh, understanding uh, a timestamp. So this is a big deal. Um, and also like, um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna first print da.time, okay? So time is a coordinate, which is which is what you're printing. It's a, it's a dimension, but, uh, the values in the dimensions are coordinates, right? So the original time looks like this, right? Not, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, of course it's understandable, it's not too bad. But you can also do interesting things like, so DT is a, another package uh, and you can say dt.day of week. And instead of that timestamp you saw, you now get like numerical values for like which day of the week it is. Okay, um, and also like, uh, so again, we're using the DD uh, package and also see how we can just use dot after dot after dot. So it's like chaining of operations. So uh, instead of saying DA dot time, you can also say DA um, like this, okay? Um, this is another way of accessing the same time dimension. So over here, what I'm doing is, um, I'm, whatever time that we saw originally, I'm formatting in a way that's more readable. So day of the week, month, um, you know, day. So we can use neat uh, format, uh, um, like format strings like this. And of course, like this is more a demo. Uh, we can't go in depth into just this functionality, but it's there for you to use if you want, right? And also, uh, if you were to plot a NumPy array, um, you have to go through the paces. I mean, it's, it's not very hard. You just have to do some matplotlib initialization to plot the NumPy array. But with X-ray, it's much simpler. Like the matplotlib feature is like, it works closely with matplotlib to uh, have a plot function. So like in the, what I'm doing now is I'm using the data array. I'm using a select function, um, selecting when X is 
20, then I can just call plot. And it did many things here automatically. So first of all, it recognized that it's a 2D data, right? Because you, it was a 3D data, you, we cut one of the dimensions, the X dimension, we sliced it along X. And so it realized that it had to do a contour plot. And, um, and it auto-generated, for example, the Y labels, like because we gave it what the coordinates of Y were, it used it as the tick labels here, 10 to 50. And over here, it's even plotting time in a very readable format. And if you were to do this in matplotlib, it'll take you a little bit, like it's not too complicated, but it'll definitely take you like, you know, like some six, seven lines or something to like make this happen at least. Um, and also it shows like a color bar automatically, right? So the, the plot function makes this sort of magic. happen. And also, uh, let's say we now slice the data more to make it one dimensional. So I'm saying uh, select X is 20. So you can use a comma to separate the two conditions. So X is 20 and Y is 40, right? You don't need to use an and or any uh, you know, condition like that. So X is 20, comma Y is 40, dot plot. And over here, I'm passing some more information to uh, et cetera. And I'm saying marker, use this as the marker. Um, and so another neat thing is that if you, if, you already, if you already have the hang of like matplotlib and you already know how to like customize your plots, you can still send those arguments to matplotlib using as an argument to plot, okay? So doing so, um, so X-Ray automatically knew to plot the line, but I'm just suggesting that it used the marker and, and it did. So um, yeah, so these are some uh, basic plotting functionalities that will come to all the time. So now, um, so we, we saw some selecting data, right? We, we technically did slice it, uh, but over here, we're gonna slice over a range uh, instead of just a single value. So, uh, and before that, I'm gonna introduce another function, yeah. So like cell, there's another function called ISA. So cell, in cell, you, uh, we selected the dimensions by the values, right? So uh, we selected the value of X when it was 20 and Y when it was 40. But we also have another way of doing it. With ISEL, uh, we can use positions. So if 20 was the second X position, I can use ISEL X, equal to one because zero is the first one, right? So a NumPy equivalent of doing um, the slicing, uh, for example, then if, if you want to uh, slice the NumPy temperature array data um, over from, start, uh, from the starting point to the third element, from the fourth element, to the end, and then from the third element to the sixth element. To do something like this, uh, you can use uh, this syntax in Excel. So you can say time is slice um, two to five. And the order doesn't matter. You can put time at the end, you can put it at the start. Over here, the third dimension is time, right? And X is sliced from none because we want to start at the beginning to two, right? And Y goes from slice three to the end. So it's none again, okay? So that will lead to a sliced data. Uh, you may want, you know, you may want to slice data from time to time. So this I showed you previously. Um, so, uh, this is what he started with. X-Array has data, dimensions, coordinates. If you just want to print the list of dimensions, you just do da.dims. So the data array object dot dims, right? And then you can also print what the coordinates are. Um, so uh, yeah, so doing this will print what the coordinates are. 
what is the difference between a coordinate and a dimension? A coordinate is just what are the actual values for that dimension, right? Whereas the dimension represents the direction. Um, and then finally, you can also print attributes. So the dot operator comes in handy, right? Um, okay, so finally, uh, uh, let's go back to the X-ray object itself. Yeah. So in the X-ray object, uh, we have the data itself as a NumPy array. And over here, X and Y, what are they? Um, so if you look at them, they're, they're also technically like inside they are NumPy arrays. So over here, sorry for the scrolling. Um, I can say things like da.x. So if I do da.x, you have an X-ray data array and it's just printing what the coordinates are. But let's say I want this actual, the values of the arrays instead. I don't want this whatever fancy formatting there is. So I can just say da.x. Um, dot data and doing so will give me just the array, right? Okay, so now that I introduced what an X-ray data array is, um, specifically it's for like a single case of like temperature varying over space and time. So the temperature can have like a latitude and longitude dimension, can have the time dimension can have like also depth, right? But what if you wanted, so usually if you open any geoscience data sets, um, there's like more than one variable, there's temperature and pressure, right? So here you have like multiple data arrays in a sense, but in X-ray, it's not just multiple data arrays. You can neatly package them so that they share information. After all, like if you have temperature over a certain region of the earth, you're also gonna have pressure data for the same coordinates, right? It's not gonna be a different set. So a data set is a way of like sharing that information. So here, it's not just a single data field, it's a data wars, okay? So it's like multiple variables, but the dims and coordinates attributes, they remain the same. So for, to, uh, for an X array data set, uh, instead of a single um, single variable like we did before, now we have two. And we can also give the data variables like names. Um, so let's call this A. So A varies spatially and also over time. And I also indicate how to initialize this data. So like in the previous example, we first created a NumPy data array in the first part and then used it. Over here, this is a different syntax for doing the same thing. We're like, again, using a NumPy random thing of like size five by five by four, um, but it's a shorter way of like storing the data, right? And also now I have another uh, variable B. B has just X and Y common with A but it doesn't have a time dimension. So this time it's NumPy five by five, okay? And the coordinates just the same as last time. It's not new. Um, and also attributes, same. So um, most often like when we read a NetCDF file, you're gonna find that it's an X-ray data set, not a data array, because this sort of a format is very similar to how a net CDF, uh, the net CDF's internal data model, right? So uh, that is also uh, the way that this is constructed the way it is, uh, specifically to be useful for people, you know, using net CDF files or like geospatial data, right? Um, um, so this is just a way of like obtaining the data array A. So you can also use ds.a or ds, you know, within the square bracket. So, um, okay, so I think I'm gonna quickly pause to ask if there are any questions um, at this point. I know I'm a little behind time. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, we will have a break soon. Uh, I think in about 20 minutes. Yeah. That's actually a good question. And I think, I think the difference shows up. Um, it's a little more higher level than I want, I want to cover today. But if you use Dask along with X-Array, there are certain differences that start to show up. So yes, there is a subtle difference between them. Um, so I'm actually happy to go over it later. Thank you for that question. Okay, so okay, I O. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's a great question. So the file type, actually, I'm exactly like coming to that aspect now. So good, uh, thanks for the question. So what sort of files would you use it for? So X-ray is predominantly for uh, geospatial data. So, and a lot of geospatial data sets are in the NetCDF file format. So NetCDF is like the predominant format, you know, like uh, of relevance for this sort of a thing. And X-ray supports like, so implicitly it supports, uh, by implicitly, I mean, it interfaces with the NetCDF library to support reading and writing from a NetCDF file. Uh, and in addition, it also supports the ZAR format uh, and also uh, this GeoTIFF, uh, like a raster file format, which I'm not experienced with. ZAR, I can, you know, it's a, it's a more advanced course, so I won't go there, but ZAR is optimized for storing on the clouds. Um, so to create a, uh, so we already had a data set, an X-ray data set. And I talked about how an X-ray data set resembles an XCDF file. So X-ray actually makes it very simple to write the, what data is in memory to an XCDF file. So you can just say a data set. So it's not a data array. So it's a DS for data set dot to NetCDF, right? So, and then just give it a name. Um, okay, I'm sorry about that. Should I run this? Okay. So once we have that defined, so now ds.netcdf uh, has written out this file for me. And now let's say you already had a netcdf file and now you want to open it, which is the most common case because uh, the dummy data that I talked about is just to give you like a basic hands-on, but it's not like, you know, you're not gonna use that most, most often. So most often you're gonna use xarray.open data set, okay? So um, the, to, write, to write a file, it's to net CDF. Uh, to open the data set, it's xarray.open data set. And using the same file name, but you're calling it DS1 just to distinguish it from what we had before. So running this, we see we have everything. So we created the dummy data, wrote it out to an NetCDF file, opening it from an NetCDF file, okay? And it's in the memory array again as an X-ray data set, okay? So, so far so good. So now I wanna give you a few minutes um, um, to uh, maybe I wanna say uh, three minutes to work on this exercise. Uh, so it's an hands-on exercise. I'll um, uh, read through it. I can actually read it for you. So create an X-ray data set with the following. So uh, the variables are, uh, there's a height and temperature. So height has dimensions, latitude and longitude. You can use random data like before. Temperature with time, latitude and longitude. Uh, and the dimensions, latitude needs to vary from minus 90 to 90, longitude from minus 180 to 80, uh, time, first 10 days of May, 2021. <clears throat> so I've already created what latitude and longitude and time should look like, um, but uh, you will need to try to figure everything else out. And there's also the solution at the bottom, I think. And if you don't see the solution, um, 
if it looks like this, you can click on that to expand it. So you'll see the solution. So yeah, this will be a good time to ask me any questions. Okay, um, there was a question about the I cell method. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, so, so over here, I'm just printing ds dot a, right? So a is a X-ray data array. Um, so, uh, okay, that's another thing I didn't point out. So when you select from, um, when you select a data variable from a data set, the output is an X-ray data array. So they're like mutually compatible, right? So if, uh, if I wanted to select um, X equal to 20, uh, when X has the value 20, I can just say cell of X equal to 20. And that gives me this. But let's say I don't want to use the value. I want to use the position. So then I use I, the position or the index, right? And over here, you can't say 20. All we know is um, X is 20 at the second position. So zero, one, right? Because Python starts from zero, uh, the indexing. So it's zero, one. So X equal to one gives the same thing. So it's exactly the same. It's just, you know, either you can select by the actual value or the index. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's uh, uh, move on to the next one. And you know, you can ask me questions during the break and also like uh, after the class and there's also the solutions. So you can take a look at them. So now we're going to the second notebook, um, X-ray with climate data. So a lot of material for this class and um, you know, I'm gonna try my best to go through them all, but um, okay, so so far we worked on dummy data, right? Um, I just showed them just to sort of illustrate some basic points, which, which are like crucial to understand the whole thing. So now we're opening some actual climate data um, model output from the community earth system model. Um, uh, specifically it's from the IHESP lab and time oceanography. Uh, so using some, uh, the pop ocean model output. Actually, this one is a low resolution. We'll show high resolution next. Um, 
So the background is, I mean, the details you can read later, uh, but the NetCDF file for this um, is over here. Um, and you don't have to do anything. You just have to run the cell. But I quickly want to point out that um, for folks who for folks who don't have a HPRC account, um, you can actually click on data sources in my GitHub page, and you can download these NetCDF files to your local machine. Okay, and then you can um, then you can change the path to your local path, you know, whatever machine wherever you downloaded it, and follow along with the examples. So yeah, so if you're not on Grace, then you'll have to do that. Okay, so now again, we're importing XRA as XR. The file path is defined. XR.open data set, file name. Uh, let's do that. So um, this is actually fast um, because it's a relatively low resolution file. Um, so this has like much more information, right? So the lot of dimensions. Um, it's got the time dimension. It's got the Z dimension, just looking at the ones in the old font. Uh, even Z has like multiple dimension. Like they're like, because uh, in geo geosciences um, and especially like these climate models and everything, it's, it's not a simple grid we're using. If you're using like complex staggered grids, you know, they're like so many positions and uh, all these Z values are at different um, positions. So anyway, uh, the coordinate information exists for those things. And then the 162 data variables. So there's like a real world data set, right? Um, so the real deal basically. So, but uh, just quickly before I jump into the data, uh, the, the output of the, the CESM, the POP uh, ocean model, it confirms to, uh, the so-called like CF, the climate and forecast metadata conventions. Um, and I'll put some details here, I can't go through it, but it's important because uh, you remember like in the previous example, we used a pandas date range to like specify the value of time and which is why we're able to like select time so easily. If you want some uh, such niceties, X X-ray is expecting that your NetCDF file have timestamps and many other things like for example, temperature, what are the units of temperature? Because uh, it's gonna need it for many things that it's doing internally. So uh, basically it's just uh, adding, like standardizing your output data, right? So that is what the CF convention is. So this file opening already confirms to that, more or less. Um, and we'll, we'll come to that later. So now we inspect the salt variable, just like, uh, before. So it's just ds.salt. Um, so this is the salinity. And you can see it's a, it's a three-dimensional time varying data set. So there's a time, the z underscore t, which is the depth coordinate. There's an n lat, n long, right? So, and you see the attributes are all there. That's why it's like, I say it's like a CF compliant data set. So now, um, I guess we already saw what an I cell is. So I guess I was going to explain it here. So ds.salt.i cell z, z underscore t equal to one selects the second depth slice, right? So then you have, um, um, actually, let me run this. Okay. So you have the time coordinate, but also you have a u long, u lat, t long, t lat. What are these? Uh, again, it's because of the grid staggering, which I think I'll come to soon, soon enough. Um, uh, like some of the variables like temperature and salinity are stored on the T grid. And the coordinates for the T grid are T lat and T long. But velocity is stored on the U grid. So that's why it's U lat and U long. So technically this is not relevant to the salt because salt is stored on uh, the T grid. Okay, so let's try some interesting operations now. So to take the mean 
uh, compute the mean of salinity over the depth dimension. So basically we're taking uh, 4D data, right? A 3D in space and uh, extra in time, right? And taking the mean over the depth dimension. So now you'll have lat, long, and time. So you can just say ds.salt.mean uh, and you can use the name dimension z underscore t. And if you do that and you print it, we see that salt's dimension has reduced from four to three, right? So time six and lat and n long. Of course, it's showing nan here because these are the edge values where there's land and we're looking at ocean data. Uh, but you can actually plot it also. So now we are gonna say, we use the mean, we have to do I cell time equal to zero because it's, it's varying in time also. It's 2D data, but it's varying in time. So we have to select it um, for any time instance, right? And so you say time equal to zero and plot. And you see how um, uh, X-ray plots this. I mean, it's just to be fair, it's not really hard because uh, this is very similar to what I showed you before, right? Um, but notice that the map looks a little weird because there's not been a projection applied yet, right? So the, the areas are not representative of like what's happening, actually happening. So it's just a very rough plot of the whole region, right? So to make a nicer plot, uh, first you're gonna do two things. You're gonna take it step by step. So firstly, I'm gonna start using matplotlib now explicitly. In the previous statement, this called matplotlib underneath, right? But now I'm like sort of explicitly enforcing plotting using matplot. So I'm saying import matplotlib.pyplot and I have an alias for it. I call it PLT just as a short form. Uh, this uh, I'll maybe explain later, let's not get into it now. So, but pay attention to this function, plt.subplots, so what I want in this case is I want a single row of plots with two columns. So that's why I say plt.subplots one comma two. So one column, sorry, one row, two columns. And then I'm indicating the size of my figure in, you know, uh, in width times height, right? That's 14 comma four. And then the output, uh, this may seem a little intimidating if you're not used to this, but basically what I'm, what I'm asking for is, firstly, when you ask matplotlib uh, for a subplot, you first need a canvas, right? Let's say you have an entire canvas. Over here, this whole white space here at the bottom, that's the canvas. And the canvas is, you can think of, uh, matplotlib calls it a figure, right? Um, and a figure object is important. So here F corresponds to the figure object. So when you call subplots, matplotlib uh, returns a figure handle, right? That's the whole canvas. But within the canvas, I, I also told matplotlib that I want two subplots. So within, within a figure, there are things called axes. And so we have this axis here, right? This n lat axis, and lon axes, and lat axes, and lon axes. So there are two pairs of axes, right? And axes are represented by this AX object, AX1 and AX2. So AX1 is this one, AX2 is this one. So instead of like uh, just saying salt.plot, I'm over here saying ds.salt.icell, select whatever you want, plot. To the plot, I'm passing axis. So I'm saying the first plot should go to the first axis. So plot the salt there, plot the temperature here, right? So matplotlib generated the canvas and the axis. And then I'm using xarray.plot to just say, oh, this should be here, that should be there, okay? And the robust equal to true, uh, ask me later what it is, I don't want to waste time with that. So now we see two plots, right? Uh, salt and temp. 
this still doesn't have a projection. So now we have to start using a projection. For that, we need Cato pi, okay? So uh, um, actually I'll uh, speed through with this. I'll pause for questions, you know, during the break. So um, Cato pi, like I mentioned before, works with matplotlib um, to give you like map, you know, a plotting um, functions for geospatial data. So we say import Cato pi, uh, I ask you to ignore this line. Uh, I only have that line because uh, this notebook is probably not connected to the internet. You can't access the internet from where I am. So uh, if you ask, um, uh, so Cato pi is gonna try to download things and we don't have internet, which is why I have that line. So yeah. Um, yes, um, so this, so the subplots, it's, uh, it's generating the figure handle and it's also generating the axis handle. So, so you see, first of all, he's uh, specified a figure size, right? So the F object is gonna have that whole figure size in its specification, right? And then you said subplots one comma two. So, now matplotlib knows to give you two axes on the same row, but two different columns, and it kind of knows how to space them out, right? So all that information is encoded in F and AX1 and AX2. So that is what that function is doing. But this is just one way of generating this image. Uh, it can also have said uh, plt.figure. So over here, we're getting the figure and the axis separately. Okay, so over here, we're first generating the figure object, calling it fig, same as F before. And then we're generating the axis object, um, which is called AX. Um, but the interesting thing I'll be doing now is I'm saying, um, and the reason I'm splitting it up into two lines is because I want matplotlib, um, matplotlib to, use a projection, a map projection. And the projection is coming from Cato pi. So I'm saying projection equal to Cato pi dot CRS dot plate carry. Um, you also have Mercator, you know, um, Lambert um, and everything. Like it, there's a whole array of projections. You, you just have to go to the Cato pi documentation to like look them up. That's like, you know, vast things you can do. So now, uh, what do we do with that? We saved longitude to uh, a variable. We saved latitude to a variable. And because we're using temperature, I'm just selecting T long. I'm using the T grid, not the U grid. So I'm not selecting U long, U lat. T long, T lat is what we use. And the var, we just slice it so that we have just two dimensional data, right? And then we use AX dot uh, AX is the axis object, right? So A AX dot P color mesh, lon, lat, var. So X, Y, data, Z, right? And then we say transform equal to Cato pi dot CRS dot take care. Uh, I think we should go. Yeah, sorry. Is there any reason why you, you couldn't, when you defined your variables, long, lat, and care? to put him in the color mesh command line. Well, absolutely. Could you, could you not just type in df.t long instead of lon? Oh, totally, you can do that. So, okay. uh, so this is just for, to make it- easier. Yeah, this is to make it more presentable. Right. Yeah, so of course you can save those lines. You can, you know, you can call ax.p color mesh. Instead of lon, you can call ds.t long. It's the same thing. Um, so it's pretty flexible like that. So the key ingredient there is the transform, right? Uh, the transform is why we need Cato pi. Um, and also like there's some shading thing we want, which I want to go into right now because I'm not in a position to speak about it. So I'm so showing you something basic. Uh, and if there's like more advanced questions, I'll take them later, specifically with the shading. For now, I think we needed to plot this data. Um, 
we use the card uh, the plate carry transform we can use other sorts of transform okay um and i think it's time for your break so um let's actually meet let's break now and uh, let's meet at 11:40 And meanwhile, I can take questions if you want. Okay, I um, guess you can get started. Um, this, so some, sometimes on, uh, I hope you can see my Jupyter Lab screen, um, people on Zoom. So sometimes you get these server connection error messages when you're using the um, Jupyter Hub portal. Um, um, it happens on Grace. It also happens on other machines. It doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong. Uh, so sometimes it's just, you can dismiss it and you can still go on with your business as usual. So sometimes it keeps popping up. Um, and it may be a bug in the Jupyter software. I'm not sure what's going on. That's something we need to look into, but it doesn't mean your session is crashed. Okay. So, um, and before I start, I'll quickly answer the question. So does X-ray only load NetCDF files? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, so X-ray is uh, developed by people who, who closely work with um, geospatial data. And so uh, the data that uh, like, the folks for whom uh, X-ray will be beneficial are people who use geospatial or similarly structured data. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like you could be in like astronomy and like, you know, have like uh, a similarly structured data and it could be useful. Um, but yes, X-ray is expecting NetCDF. And of course, NetCDF is closely tied to HDF5 format. Um, so things in the HDF5 format can also be open with X-ray. Um, there's also the czar format, which is new, uh, a new way of doing things. Uh, but yes, uh, like we're looking at data, which has like the spatial and, you know, temporal components. So, yeah. Okay. So we previously plotted this example and now we want to make it look a little nicer. So. We imported Carto Pi previously, and we did P color mesh. Um, and now uh, we're going to do this pretty much the same thing we did before. Lawn, lat, var are same from the previous cell. But what we're doing now is we're setting um, uh, an, an axis title, uh, and the smart, uh, I mean, the smart way is just to uh, take the title from the data set. Uh, so ds.title, and you can add coastlines by simply saying ax.coastlines. There are also more advanced ways of specifying this, um, but for now, uh, ax.coastlines, ax.gridlines. So you see this thick curl at the coast over here. So that's your coastline. Um, uh, without the ax dot coast lines, um, your coast will look a little jagged. So that's why like we add like an emphasis on that. And so you see the grid lines here that's added by this. And then you have an axis dot. Uh, so here we see that we have the Great Lakes. You know, we have all the lakes showing up here. So how we made that happen is, sorry about this, ax dot add feature. Uh, and we say, so, in the top, we said um, cartopi.feature, uh, we call it C feature. So we say cartopi.feature.lakes. And saying that adds these lakes. And over here, uh, it's also as easy to add C feature.land, but for some reason, the colors were a little messed up. And so I realized 
we had to like use this full expression over here to like um, make the land, like specify the land colors for some reason. But there's also a simpler syntax that often works. So that's why I have this full expression over here. I don't want to waste time on that. So I'll, I'll move on, but uh, for a full list of things, you you know, are encouraged to go into the CartoPy documentation. Um, there's, uh, it's, it's a tremendous like tool. There are also other uh, tools that are like coming up, which, you know, um, make it simpler to plot, which uh, we can probably discuss later. Okay, so after having done all this, we wanna save our plot. So you can just say fig dot save fig. And I wanna save it as a PNG for now. You can also save it as a PDF, whatever. And this is optional, but you can specify the dots per inch if you want uh, you know, like a nicer figure, just gonna take up more disk space. But you can't say ax.save fig. You need, you need a figure object, which is also sort of the reason why, you know, I like uh, trying to get a figure object. Um, so only a figure object has the save fig. So you can at least save an entire canvas. You can't just save the axes as a figure, you know. So uh, a few other nifty things. Um, so um, actually I'll, uh, so you can also specify which axes you want as your Y axis. It doesn't need to be just lat and lawn specifically. You can also use uh, sometimes in your plotting depth profiles of temperature and so on, you wanna in, uh, shift the axes. So in that case, you can explicitly say my Y uh, is ZT. You can also say the Y is salinity, you know, you can shift, shift it up. And you can also use things like Y increase is false. So it's like uh, you get a decreasing axis instead of it. So the axis direction is inverted. And see here, I'm also using a log scale. So Y scale is log. So all these are matplotlib arguments. And so we're just passing matplotlib arguments via XY, right? So finally, after having done everything, I'm going to do ds.close. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to skip this in the interest of time. I'll, I'll come back to it, but you have an exercise here and feel free to like try it. And of course, you can reach out to me later with questions. Um, but let's go to the next notebook. I have a question. Yeah. So. You, you typed it in, so now I have to know how would you zoom in on a region of a map? Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I have to blame you. You typed it in. Um, but yeah, what if I only wanted to see Gulf of Mexico or something like that? Is there like a bound command? Or... Yes. You remember how we did this slice thing? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how would you zoom into a region? Um, and the way to do that is, where was it? Somewhere here there was yeah, slicing. So uh, if you wanted to zoom in on a region, typically what you do is take a slice of the lat and lawn. Um, and so specify just a sub region for the lat and lawn. So you can use this way of slicing to select that, right? So that is how. I mean, and there might be, uh, there are better and better libraries coming which simplify the task. Um, but I'm not an expert on them. So I, I just want to throw it out there. There, there, are, there are like um, libraries which help with um, um, taking some of the manual thing even out of X-ray. So even higher level. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly check. Um, okay. Um, one thing I actually uh, want to show you while it's working is, so if you want to click on this link, so if you go to my course page, uh, if you go to pre-class instructions, and it'll take you to this nice uh, text page, and you just click on this link, mybinder.org, uh, step seven. And 
that'll be a nice little break from what I'm showing you presently. Um, so when you do that, it's gonna, it's gonna take some time. So it's not gonna load right away for you, just to give you a heads up. So let it load, right? Let it take its time. But when it eventually loads, uh, you'll get some notebook like this. So what is going on? Um, so why this link and uh, why am I doing this online? Just to give you like, at the start of the class, I mentioned that we can run this whole setup on your local laptop, your local machine, or you can run it on a HPC cluster, mm -hmm. or you can run it on the cloud. Um, and this notebook over here is actually running on the cloud. So it's running because of some folks from, I don't even know where. So the like folks, you know, all across the world hosting these uh, like uh, Jupyter Hub uh, servers. And so we're using their resources to like run it. So if you click on it, you may be taken to a different such host, but it's all like technically on the cloud. There's no single such HPC. Part of it is to show you that, you know, it's a nice way of, uh, if you have some um, um, notebooks that you want to make public um, and also make it interactive, this is a nice way of like giving it to people, right? And so, and another thing is, uh, I'm not sure about like, so when you're running uh, Jupyter Lab on the portal, um, I, I think you don't have access to the internet. I don't know how it's changed because yesterday it was behaving a little weirdly. It was giving me internet access, but typically it doesn't let connections to the internet uh, by design to keep you, you know, keep everything secure. Uh, so, and this needs some connections to the internet. So. This is an example using a package called Siphon. And so this is a small deviation from X-Array, but uh, it's interesting, it, it can still work with X-Array, right? And so uh, people aren't just using um, uh, NetCD of files all the time and just like simulation data all the time. They're also using like Oceanographers, for example, I mean, not just oceanographers, all of geosciences, they're using all these different observational data, right? And so there are all these different uh, sources on the internet uh, that make it available. And one such source is the, the National Data Buoy Center. I think it's NOAA's. And so if you, uh, so uh, this thing is actually sitting off uh, the Gulf somewhere, like. 60 miles south of like Freeport, Texas. And so this is the buoy in question. We have station this number 42019. So we wanna plot the latest data from this buoy, right? And so we now import matplotlib and this uh, new package called Siphon. So from Siphon, uh, we say siphon.simplewebservice.ndbc, import ndbc. Um, so Siphon has um, many specific libraries for accessing many, uh, many kinds of data. So it, it's created the interface for accessing those data. So I'm gonna to try to run this. Hopefully everything is fine. Okay. And so, I mean, this is just a web page thing I wanted to show you, but in the next line, what I'm doing is I'm saying ndbc dot real time observations, and I'm just using the station number, right? And and but here's the thing: this is not X-ray anymore. It's pandas. It's it's a pandas data frame. And so I don't want to go into pandas too much, but I will say this: so like how X-ray is for geospatial data and like NetCDF files, right? Pandas works well, uh, and I, I'm out of my depth here, but um, a simplified way of thinking about it is like your Excel files, your CSV files, pandas can read that and like process it like magic. So what X-ray can do for NetCDF, pandas can do for, so pandas uh, like, it predates NetCDF in that aspect. So you're getting a pandas data frame, which is a structure like this. And so it's basically uh, like just 
displaying like some of the values, we see all the fields that we have. And this is like an Excel table, right? In some sense, a, a CSV file. And so this data frame, it's like accessing a pandas, uh, uh, the elements in a pandas array and an X array, uh, you know, data set, not very, uh, not very different. So we did this before, right? Subplots. Um, I maybe won't go, uh, I can explain this later if you want, but let's keep it. Uh, so what we're doing is we're just saying, remember how we selected a variable from X-ray, either like the dot or like the square bracket function. So here it's just the same thing with the pandas data frame. So you're selecting DF time, uh, pressure, uh, and uh, yeah. So on the X-axis you have time, Y axis are pressure. And this is real time data, like uh, from uh, 920, uh, number, um, sorry, uh, yeah, from September 22 to basically now, right? And um, yeah, you're plotting the temperature, uh, pressure, wind speed, water temperature for this buoy. So it's a pretty cool. I mean, you can look at a notebook from your Jupyter lab on Grace, right? But I don't know if you run it, it it'll actually, um, I want to show you this just in case. Okay, so this is like buoy data, right? Um, so in addition, Siphon can also do satellite data. So uh, you probably, many of you have probably heard of the, the GOES, uh, like the geos, uh, geostationary satellite. Um, it's I think it's one of the highest resolution satellites, you know, like monitoring a lot of um, um, quantities of interest to the geoscience community. And so there's a lot of things here which don't worry about it. Um, uh, this is just an example, so don't try to understand it. But just as an example, uh, since we're here, I wanted to run it and show you. So this is an example from the uh, Unidata um, Python workshop. So this is not my notebook, but it's a cool notebook that I thought I have to show you. So we can basically select Kona, such as the continental United States. Um, and we can select whatever, um, data you want. Um, yeah, so basically data from the GOES satellite. I um, think it's like recent data. Um, yeah, with like nice plotting capabilities. So I, you know, it's like, if you're switching to Python, it's like, I would think this is like one of like the cool examples that might like convince you or something. So yeah, these are just things I wanted to show you, but now back to the regular programming. Okay, so returning to um, the NetCDF files, this time we're op going to open a slightly different file. So in the last file that we opened, we opened what is called in, um, in the climate science community, we call it like a history file format. So it's like, we have um, all the variables like temperature, salinity, and so on, maybe 20 variables saved for either a single timestamp or like eight times or a short burst of time. But then you have many such time slices, right? Or you also have so-called time series of variable format files, where it's a single variable. So the NetCDF file only contains a single variable. It doesn't contain temperature and salinity. For example, in this case, it only contains the sea surface temperature SST for all times. And of course it contains all the identifying dimensions and all that, you know, metadata. So we're opening a different file so that I can show you what uh, sort of time-based operations X-Array has. Um, so we'll go through that. So, so first I'm gonna say import X-Array as a star, file name, open data set. And 
here's an interesting thing. So we say decode times equal to true. And the reason we say this is um, we want X-ray to uh, like parse the timestamps. Uh, so let's say uh, later we'll be like, um, can you give me an average over every two months? And so X-ray has to know what a month is, right? And so it has to try to understand what the timestamps are. So when you say decode times equal to true, it's gonna to try to attempt that. And the reason it's an option is it, it slows down the opening a little bit. So you, you can save time by saying decode times equal to false. But in this case, we actually need that function. So, so you open this file, we only have T long, T lat, okay? Um, and we have SSD. SSD is our main thing. So time bound, don't, don't worry about it. Um, so the first thing we do is ssd.mean over the time dimension, which you pretty much already know. Um, so when you do the mean over the time dimension, the time dimension is eliminated. Uh, so you have like a 1200 time stamps, okay? So now that's reduced and it's now become a 2D variable, right? Uh, in addition to a single mean, you also have the group by. So this is where, this is like very powerful functionality that XRA offers. So a, a group by is basically, um, let's say you have like uh, SST data. So you have SST data here for a pretty long period. Um, 1995, Sorry, 1950 to 2049. So it's like, it's an actual uh, climate data um, for like 100 years, right? But it's monthly data. So it's, it's monthly average. So we have like 1200 months, right? And in geosciences, you're like typically concerned about monthly climatologies. So we're basically taking the 1200 timestamps and we're binning them. So we're like, whatever data is from month January, put them in the January bin and whatever is in you know February and so on until December, right? So you first bin them. So split your data into independent groups. Uh, then we want to just uh, average whatever is there in January, right? So that is typically how we do climatology, right? Bin them, like split them, average them individually and press in the output. So now instead of 1200 timestamps, your output will just have like 12 because you only have 12 months, right? So to do that, in X-ray, it's very simple. So you can say ds data set dot group by. So the group by is what does the binning. So in the group by, the magic is you can say time dot season. So I'm not even saying months, I'm saying season. Um, not only does X-ray understand months, it can also, you know, it understands like season. And the reason for this is it's, it's built on top of pandas and pandas is great with time and like how it understands time. So this first thing, it groups them up. So actually what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So when I do, uh, um, sorry about that. So when we do this, uh, the data set group by, uh, so instead of like having the 1200 time dimensions, it's now grouped into four seasons. So December, Jan, you know, winter, uh, spring, summer, fall. So the next operation is the dot mean, right? So when you do this, I'm sorry. So when you do this, um, so time dot season, because uh, you have to tell X-ray that season belongs to the time dimension, right? You can't say lat dot season. You have to say time dot season because otherwise you'll get an error. And the mean is still over time, 
So uh, you're not saying time dot season, you're saying actually just time, right? Because you're still, for each bin, you're averaging over the time, right? And the result is you have n lat, n lon, but you have a season. So whatever this thing you added over here, it's, it's, it's the climatology thing now. So seasonal climatology. So you have four seasons. So this, I mean, if you really want to change the order of seasons, because it's like, uh, I think it's like winter. Uh, actually, I think they changed the behavior maybe. So maybe it's no longer applicable. So let's skip this cell. Okay, so now we have seasonal mean, this variable, which has the climatology, right? So you say seasonal mean dot SST, it's still a data set, so you have to get the data array, SST dot plot. And like magic, you can just plot all the seasons next to each other. You can just say call uh, column equal to season. Um, and now I'll explain what robust is. Um, so typically, uh, and I think robust may not be necessary here. So basically vmin and vmax specify what the min and max of the contour plots are. So by default, uh, XRA like, you know, like tries to generate like the min and max values for your contour plots that uh, seem best to it. Um, it's not always great. So vmin and vmax tell XRA to use that instead. Don't do your own like uh, guesstimating. And then the robust equal to true also helps with some of X-rays guesses, but um, I think I'll skip. Uh, um, I think you can use robust equal to true instead of vmin and vmax, but vmin and vmax will over overwrite the robust equal to true. The robust basically means the it it takes some extra consideration into how it generates the the contour levels. Okay, so we generated the climatology, we plotted it. Um, so now we're going to do. Uh, so now you have like actual time varying data, right? So you can do interesting things with it. So, um, so now in this example, we're gonna uh, try to, um, um, so let's say um, the first order of business would be, um, uh, would be to, um, let's say first you wanna bin the 1200 time slices into uh, seasonal bins, winter, uh, spring, you know, um, fall, et cetera. And then for each of the bin, um, you wanna compare with historic. So let's say we binned it, but we wanna also see how each month data compares to the mean of that season. So uh, let's say you have a January month. You don't want to compare to just other Januaries. You want to compare with the whole winter. So over here, what we do is we do ds dot group by time dot season. So that does the binning, right? But we already have a seasonal mean that's just the averages. Um, so over here, uh, then we try to plot it over here. So you, you see, in this thing, we just generate um, the the the, like the, the SST anomalies for each month uh, with the baseline as um, the particular season, right? So this is a way of doing it. So it's, it's a very neat way of doing it. Um, with, uh, if you just had like a NumPy array, you'd have, um, it, it's, it's, it's a little more complex. And the reason I had to import NC time axis here is because otherwise, um, this this thing uh, X-ray has some difficulty plotting this time without this thing. Um, um, so I, I can go into it later if you have a question. So here we just generated the raw data, right? Like we just plotted all twelve hundred points. But then you probably also want to resample. So instead of every twelve hundred, so we're talking about a hundred year data, like monthly data for from 1950 to 2050, right? Uh, 
this is very noisy. And let's say we want to convert, uh, resample our uh, monthly data to like bi-monthly. So you can simply say SST anom, which is what we got from this cell, and say dot resample time equal to, um, so time equal to two MS means it's code, it's like abbreviation for like uh, resample every two months. So uh, that's what it means. There are also other, um, um, other ways of resampling data and there are separate like sort of codes for that. And you can look into the X-ray documentation for like more details for that. So we do SST.resample time equal to this thing dot mean. Um, so what happens is now if you try to plot it, and of course I forgot to say that since it's, uh, it's, it's waiting in space, I'm just plotting a single you know, location, single lat long. I picked what I wanted to plot. So you see how it's reduced that noise because we resampled it a little bit. Um, a rolling window is also quite similar. Um, so you can say SST anom dot rolling. So a rolling window average, uh, as you may know, it's just like, for example, for the for the whole COVID thing, you know, we're still living in. Um, like, if you looked at the instantaneous data, it was like it was very varying and like, um, because like often like testing was lagging, you know, on weekends you didn't have test results. So looking at the instantaneous data, you, that, that would be like misleading. So what uh, the data analyst started doing was doing a um, rolling average over like two weeks so that it's, it's a much more consistent curve and like um, it's, it's much more predictable that way. So there are, you know, uh, places where it's used quite a bit in like a lot of these time series analysis. So over here, we're doing uh, a seven day rolling window. Um, actually it's not seven day, it's seven months. So we say time equal to seven, but each slice is actually a month. So this is a seven month rolling window and we're talking hundred years, right? So um, a rolling window um, can be uh, applied along any, dimensions. Um, I think it also works. Um, so resampling primarily works with the time index dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. But at the rolling window, it works with any like even space dimensions. Uh, Coarsen does something similar to resample, but without being aware of time. Uh, it only works on logical coordinates. So uh, you can think of it similar to rolling, but uh, not for time, it's for space. So what we, what I'm doing here is I'm just course, like uh, this had like whatever level of accuracy. Um, I think it's like um, one degree over the ocean. So it's already pretty coarse, but I'm like intentionally coarsening it even more. So it becomes like basically a two degree mesh, right? Um, so this is the way to do a course in operation. Okay, I think I'll give you some time for this exercise. And meanwhile, if you have any questions, let me know. And also if this link opened up for you, feel free to try the Siphon notebooks. Um, so the only thing is if you close the browser tab, it's gonna to have to regenerate it. So, so, you know, if it has opened up, uh, keep it open um, or, you know, or you can click on it again, it's gonna regenerate it. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of behind the scenes magic. And originally I was gonna make it so that um, people who didn't have access to HPIC accounts could use this for the other exercises. But the problem is the, the, fi uh, the size of the NetCDF data sets, they're like too big and this, um, there wasn't an easy way to like move the data. So, which is why I had to provide it separately. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a question about whether there's a dependency to run um, the Siphon example. Yes, so if you're running it on your own machine, um, you would need to install Siphon. 
um, um, in small, uh, small s, i, f, uh, e, h, o, n. Um, but if you clicked on my link, um, like I said, a lot of behind the scenes things goes on and Siphon is actually installed for you. So if you click on my link and you're using that, Siphon will work. Um, but if you're using, uh, actually I'm just remembering. So if you're using Grace for this, I don't think it'll work because I don't think I've installed it on Grace. Um, so yeah, maybe after the class I can rectify that. So yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, I think I wanna proceed because this was probably the, the newer material I was working with. So I'm, you know, I wanna talk about it. Um, okay, so, so far, uh, we've talked about how to open a NetCDF file, um, do operations on time, you know, time mean and all those sort of things. There are like many, many more functions, which obviously I, I can't possibly show you. So it's like, it's just a starting point, but, a thing that is of like core interest to like the geosciences community uh, and especially people who work with like modeling or like modeling data. So you don't need to run any uh, climate or weather models yourself. If you're using data from, you know, that data set, you'll see that um, the grids are uh, not so simple, They're actually very complex. Um, and so, in all the previous things I talked about, we talked about lat and lawn and all those sort of things, but X-ray doesn't understand how the information is stored. And even before I was talking to you about there being a U grid and there being a T grid. Um, so like temperature being stored on one grid, temperature and salinity, whereas velocity is stored on the other grid, right? X-ray doesn't understand that. It has no idea what to do with it. So. Uh, you could have used the U grid to plot temperature points, which is wrong slightly, but X-ray wouldn't know, right? And so you, uh, there's this other uh, function uh, called XGCM. Um, basically, uh, actually, let me show you the slide first. So, XRA doesn't implicitly understand uh, GCM, you know, uh, general circulation models. Uh, so XGCM is basically sitting on top of XRA. And now it adds understanding of like grid topology. So I wanna uh, say that there are so many types of grids. There's like um, structured grids, there's unstructured grids. In unstructured grids, things are complicated. So um, I'm pretty sure XGCM doesn't deal with unstructured grids. Um, I have another notebook, but I probably don't have time to go into it. So here are talking structured grids. So there's connectivity information. So what do you wanna do with structured grids? O oftentimes you wanna take spatial derivatives, right? Like um, uh, a, lo a lot of times in your research you need to compute derivatives. But because the grids are so complicated, they're not evenly spaced, you know, there's so, so much complication to them. We have to like factor all those things in. And also it's not just the horizontal grid. The, the vertical grid is also complicated. Um, so XGCM adds some functionality for all of these. So let's take the case of the ROMS ocean model, um, which some of you may be familiar with. So uh, there's this thing called the Arakawa secret. So I'm a newcomer to the geoscience thing. I have uh, my fluid mechanics is from a more fundamental fluid mechanics perspective. So I've definitely not used a secret before, you know, I'm not, so I'm just barely familiar. But in a secret, what happens is you store the U velocity on these points, the V velocity on these points, and then the density goes right here. So that's what is happening over here. So you have U over here, density over here, V over here. And so this is how like a, like a ROMS grid is structured because it uses the C grid terminology, right? And so 
what do we do with this? So let's start working. So first we uh, import X-Array as XR. Then we import XGCM. Then NumPy, we need it for later. Just Let's just open it. And now we're opening a sample ROMs file. So it is also an Ethereum file. It also opens just like the pop ocean model file that we described before. And so running it, um, so that should give us the, uh, it'll take some time. Um, and then we see all the coordinates over here. Uh, uh, ROMs calls it ocean time instead of just time. And you see all these different grids. So there's longitude on the U grid, there's longitude on the V grid, there's longitude on the row grid, right? Um, and S is the vertical dimension. And in ROMs, um, the vertical dimension is also very complicated. And which is the reason, I mean, we work with ROMs data in a group, but also it's like, it's it's a perfect example for like how hard it can be, you know, and like still it can offer some capabilities about what to do with it. So with all this information, what do you do? Like we have a C grid like this. Um, so how X-ray does things is we, uh, it it internalizes all this um, the topology, the information of the C grid with the so-called grid object. So we have to construct it manually. So, um, so you see that when in a center position, so actually I'll just show you what I mean. So here in the lowermost line, we create a grid object, we pass DS, which is the data set, the X-ray data set. But now uh, we're passing some coordinate information. So what we're saying is uh, C, uh, C underscore row, um, is on the center point. So I said anything which is density is on the center, right? And over here, that's this, the center. So what you're saying is density is located on the points of the circles, right? So it's F0, F1, so this thing, this center thing. So zero corresponds to the center dimension. And of course, what is zero? It's, uh, so if you take long row, it varies according to C row and eta row. Um, so eta is in the vertical, uh, in the y direction, z is in the x direction, okay? So zero is in the center uh, and it also, uh, uh, when we call it, uh, label it x, um, we, we're making uh, XGCM understand internally that it's the X dimension. And also there's also the ZU dimension. And this time we say inner because we know that it's over here. So if you look at this plot again, so uh, in the first cell you see rho is here, but U is here. So this is not the center. This is actually the center. So rho is the center, but U is like on the inner innermost. If you look at the whole picture, rho is at the edge, right, on both sides, and U is inside it. It's bounded by row. So that's why we have the center, and then you have the inner. So, so that U is bounded by row on both sides, right? So we're giving this all this information, similarly for Y and Z. And we add this connectivity information, give it to XGCM uh, with the so-called grid object, okay? Uh, you don't have to understand everything right now because there are, um, there's, there's code for each model uh, where they'll pretty much give you the code for what, how this should look like. So you don't need to like completely understand everything at the start. It took me a long time to, you know, figure this out. Uh, but with this information, let's try to do some things. So let's say we want to compute the flow speed, right? So let's say I want to compute the flow speed, but so flow speed is just square root of u squared plus v squared. But the problem is u is sitting over here, v is sitting over here. So what do you do? We have to interpolate them spatially to some common point, right? So let's say we want to interpolate u to this row point. 
v to this row point. So that they're both sitting on the same point. So that's what they're doing here. So u rho squared, v rho squared. So how would you do that? So let's start by first selecting u and v, okay? Uh, you just say ds dot u, ds dot v dot i cell. Uh, I just want a single um, time. And also I want a single vertical level. So I say s rho is minus one because um, that's the, so the last values of s rho corresponds to the surface, um, surface velocity. And in a ROM script, things are more complicated, but I'm not gonna make it more complicated. So let's just keep it like this. But so this U is sitting on the U grid. This V is sitting on the V grid, right? If I wanna do U on the row grid, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say grid. So this is the XGCM grid object. So I'm gonna say grid dot interpolate, in, interp, interpolate, right? Interpolating U in the X direction because Remember we said u is here and you had to interpolate in the x direction, right? Uh, to rho. And then we're saying from inner, from inner it has to go uh, to center, right? So that's what they're doing. So they're saying interpolate in the x direction and which grid do you want it to go to? You want it to go to the rho grid. Uh, so that's why you said to center to the rho grid. And we say boundary equal to extent uh, just so that on the boundaries, there's extra density points, right? So what does XGCM do in that case? It just simply uh, zero the order extrapolates. So basically copies the, the last but one point to the last points, right? So that's what it's doing here. So it's very simple interpolation. So with this, so you get U rho. So similarly, V rho, we do interpolate V in the Y direction because V is over here, we have to go interpolate upwards, right? And so now we've got U rho and V rho. They're interpolated all on the same grid. And now we can say speed is numpy dot square root, um, you know, the regular expression. So then you can plot it. This is what it looks like. And just take two minutes of your time to go through this last one. So um, in a ROMS grid, it's not a simple Cartesian grid. So what, what does that mean? Uh, uh, a ROMS grid would look like what, uh, what it looks like on the left side, right? So it's like very wiggly shaped. It's not at all regular, but it's still a structured grid. It's just a curvy linear grid. It's still structured, but curvilinear. This can be easily transformed to this with the help of some matrix math, right? So when Ram says Z and eta, it's actually referring to the simple thing because that's the grid it's using in memory to do all the computations. But when you're plotting, you don't want this, you want this, right? You have to translate it back to what it was. So uh, this is fine. Like we plotted zero versus eta rho, but it's not a hundred percent like technically correct. It has to be translated back, right? Um, and actually I should have included that in the plot, but maybe that's for a different day. So to, to do this transformation uh, uh, between the two things, Ram's outputs what is called a like grid matrix. So ROMS has uh, some variables called PM and PN. And so there's math here that you can look at your leisure, which translates the two. And the interesting thing is XGCM can factor all that. So over here, I give you an example of how to compute the relative vorticity. Um, so I show you how to factor in um, this curvilinear transformation and to get the actual vorticity. You can't just differentiate with respect to Z and eta. You have to change it a little so that um, you actually compute it on the complex grid over here, okay? So um, I think in the interest of time, I think I have to stop and there's pizza. 
for people here. Um, but like this expression I have here and this expression I have here translates to this code below. Okay. Um, so we use another function called grid.diff. So diff is just, you know, taking spatial difference operators. Um, so you take the spatial difference and then to compute the actual uh, vorticity, we multiply it by these grid metrics and then we plot it, okay? So uh, if you have questions, you can ask me later. This is like slightly more advanced material for people who want it. Uh, otherwise, just like don't bother with it. Um, and so you can compute the divergence of velocity. Similarly, it can also do vertical interpolation, read through it. There are materials on the internet and you can ask me questions, but I guess I'll need to stop. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you.